Hello everybody, welcome. I'm Shubro Sen from Shivnada University. I'm the director of the School of Management and Entrepreneurship. I'm really delighted that all of you could join us this evening. Uh, I'm looking forward to a very vibrant session with you. Uh, the topic is one of great interest, of course, to everybody, which is how to get the most out of your MBA, how to maximize the value you derive from your MBA, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, what I thought I would do was to just go over some generic ideas about what one can do to really optimize your MBA experience. And, uh, and that's the focus, as it were, of this conversation. So the very first dictum that I would like to share, and in some ways it's independent of where you go, who teaches you, is the vital importance of being extremely engaged and interested in your program. By choosing an MBA, you're choosing one of the fun and exciting degrees. The, when, certainly when I look back on my own career, and I have uh, I've come from a time where you got a lot of degrees, so I have two master's degrees, I have a PhD, and of course I have a bachelor's. I look back on my MBA with great fondness. It was probably one of the most interesting degrees that I could have pursued. So that's my first real suggestion for you that do this degree if you are genuinely interested in business, either working for a business or starting your own business or uh, helping others as a consultant, but are associated with business. So you must enjoy business. And when I say business, I really mean even a nonprofit or a civic organization or even the government. All organizations that have an input and an output and generate certain revenues, have costs, are in effect, for this larger definition, they are businesses. So as I said, the first key rule is that you must enjoy your program and must be engaged. I often tell students, don't give me the excuse that, oh, the program wasn't good, the teacher was average. If you are engaged with the subject, the subject is always interesting, the textbooks are always interesting, the cases are always interesting. So if you're engaged, in the program, you're going to get more than 50% of the value. The rest is all gravy. The rest is all gravy. So rule number one, want to maximize, be genuinely interested in business, and be highly engaged with your program. Now let's talk about program constructs and how programs are architected. So at Shiv Nader, for instance, we believe in a T-shaped development of young leaders. And this is not just a shift data thing, it's used in corporations, it's used in uh, various business schools around the world. So you can imagine a T-shaped function as it were. So the first thrust is really to get the horizontal breadth. You must understand the various functional areas of business very well. Your introductory courses, your introductory course in finance, your introductory course in marketing, your introductory course in organizational behavior, your introductory course in general management, your introductory course in operations, your introductory course in economics, in strategy. In our case, we also teach entrepreneurship. All of these are the vital building blocks for your program. So if you want to maximize the value, make sure that the horizontal portion of your T is strong, that you actually have dug into and enjoyed those subjects. Because those subjects are big, vital, interesting subjects. You'll see examples of how they're applied every day around you. So the fundamentals of business are what make up the horizontal portion of the T. And as I said, rule number two is make sure your business fundamentals are solid and that you dig deep into each of the core courses that any program will offer. Certainly, Shiv Nader, we are structured that way, is that we offer the core courses in a fairly in-depth way because we know to engage the students in business is the first and very important task. The third element I would suggest is the vertical portion of the T. That refers to your specializations. Now, you can pursue specializations in any of the primary subjects that I mentioned, you know, marketing, finance, OB, operations, economics, entrepreneurship, strategy, but many schools, and certainly Shiv Nader is among them, we also offer a more advanced specialization. 
So we can offer you a specialization in advanced finance, which includes financial analysis. We can offer you a, a specialization in digital marketing, which is today very, very important. We can offer you a specialization in HR, which is a natural derivative of OB, where you can study compensation and benefits, talent management. So similarly, in economics, you can study policy, you can do analysis, all of those things that will aid you to become a consultant at some point. We can do strategy. You can again do deep dives into strategy. So even the deep dive into strategy, it could be strategic measurement. There are many aspects of strategy, analytics, data science. So when you study our website or when you study any organization, any university's website that you're applying for MBA, make sure that they have specializations that interest you and especially those that are linked to a career that you might wish to pursue. So most schools have some kind of placement help. They have student-driven placement. Uh, in our case at Shivnadi University, for instance, we have a full career development center. Uh, and we're initiating student-led placement too. So we both hope it will be the best of both worlds for you. But before you think of, uh, of placement, first think of specialization. So that is the third point. As I said, the vertical part of your T is which areas can I specialize in that will help advance my career and which interests me, which excite me, which represent the kind of roles that you want to see. Now, having said that, don't get all hung up on the fact that on day one, you know your specialization. Sometimes you can take the course and then realize, wow, this is really interesting. I'd like to specialize this. So it's good to have an initial idea, but let that evolve. The key to the vertical part of the T is that your program should offer you those specializations. The program should offer that specialization and that you should have access to faculty who have advanced knowledge in that area and who can actually help you get further and deeper into the subject. Because deeper is really where the fun begins. And that's the theme of my talk today. You want to maximize value, got to get deep, got to get interested in your program. So as I said, the three points so far have been engagement, horizontal, fundamentals and the vertical part. The added component or item number four that I had listed for you, which was to learn deeply about technology. Today, as you know, we are in a technology centric world. It's one of the most exciting times for humans to be alive. Every day we hear of new startling developments, especially in science and technology whether it's nanotechnology being used in so many different ways in products, in medicine, inside our bodies, 3D printing, we're just about learning what 3D printing or additive manufacturing as it's called is going to mean for the marketplace. So 3D printing is a huge, huge development. Artificial intelligence and machine learning, you must have heard about that. That is becoming a singular factor in virtually every kind of product decision today. Uh, every kind of consumer decision that are being made, who is being targeted, what products are being offered to you. More importantly, how deeply can we target or precisely refine the offering so that the customer who chooses a particular product or service really likes it. So artificial intelligence, deep learning. Some of you may have heard of augmented reality or virtual reality. That is going to transform television. It's going to transform media. It's going to transform travel. It's going to transform shopping. Uh, it's going to transform virtually every aspect of our life uh, in conjunction with the wonderful devices that we all carry today, which is our smartphone. So I've mentioned three or four such emerging, transformative, disruptive technologies. There are many, many more coming down the pipe. Some of you may have heard of zero conductivity and fusion. These metals were discovered that remain stable at a certain cold temperature. This happened about 20 years ago. Commercial versions of those are coming out. Light bulbs that will never go out. Um, engines that never stop running. Uh, imagine what that could do to a particular segment. So 
these transformative technologies need to be part of your vocabulary, part of your understanding. At Shivnada University, we have introduced specific courses for our undergraduates, for our MBAs to learn about these technologies and then we encourage our students to apply them to common everyday problems that you see. So I would encourage you to do that. Be very interested in these new technologies and constantly look for things that bother you or things that need to be changed, things that can be improved because that's what these new technologies will do and ideally your program, if you want to optimize in your program, you should have such exposure within your program. Uh, certainly at Shivnada that is very much part of our curriculum. Uh, we expose people to all the transformative new technologies, we call in industry experts and that's something you can do. There are TED talks on every subject, there's YouTube, there's e-learning, there's many, many ways. You don't have to get it just in your school. It's nice if the program already has it built in and then forces you to think about it as part of a classroom project. But it's by no means a requirement that it has it. All I'm saying is it should be a requirement for you. Wherever you go, you should try and make sure that you embrace new technologies and you constantly ask yourself, how is this going to change the world? How is this going to change the common everyday opportunities? How will this change driving? How will this change shopping? How will this change eating? How will this change employing people? How will this change healthcare? How will this change my life? How will this change my exercise? Everything is being changed. And as I said, I only gave you a few lists. Personalized medicine is going to be one of the most exciting things that will happen in another 10 years. When you guys are older, you will all have spare parts of your own bodies. You are going to live a lot longer, which has its own implications. Retirement is going to change for you. So these emerging technology landscape uh, is very, very critical for success in business today. And so if you want to be in a good program, clearly the program should also expose you to it. And you should be forced to think about how can I apply these uh, new technologies? How are they going to change my life? How are they going to change other people's life? So that's why I often encourage people that whether you become an entrepreneur or not, we have a course called Lead Like an Entrepreneur. You learn to lead like an entrepreneur, whether you're in a government, whether you're in a nonprofit, whether you're in a corporation, you have to think like entrepreneurs do. And what is the best thing that entrepreneurs do? is that they hold themselves accountable. So I want you to think about that. When do we hold ourselves accountable for anything? It's when it really matters. When it matters, then we are saying, yes, I am going to be accountable for making this happen. That is the essential quality that distinguishes entrepreneurs. But everybody has that sense, whether you are in a job or not, you have to still accept responsibility and accountability. So as I said, Look at these problems, apply them to your life, ask yourself, how would I change things if I was a leader? So to me, that is an essential part of your learning as you go through the MBA. I like to tell people that in college in general, not just an MBA, you learn how to learn. You learn how to learn because the subject of your knowledge is always changing. You learn how to learn, you learn how to learn quickly. Uh, and you learn how to learn new and different things. So your program should give you that variety. It should give you that variety of exposure to different kinds of industries, different countries, different technologies that helps you accelerate your learning curve. Because the more things we learn, the faster we learn to learn. So that's again a key dimension of optimizing, which is embrace new technologies, embrace disruptive technologies, and then go out there and try to apply them in not only your daily life or ideas around, just as a thought exercise, even if you're not becoming an entrepreneur. But if you want to become an entrepreneur, of course, that's a great opportunity for you to actually create a business. The next item that I had for you, which was to be global facing. Today, we are truly in a global world. It's an overused word. We have, in fact, entitled our program I, I Global MBA because we didn't want to forget that this is a global world that we live in. Whether I'm in a small town, in a small region in a country, my customers can be anywhere, my suppliers can be anywhere, my employers can be anywhere in a distributed environment. 
So, we are all global citizens. Just look at what you are wearing right now. Look at what you are using. Look at how many countries are represented literally on your own body. You know, where your clothes came from, where your phone came from, where your glasses came from, where your watch came from. You know, sometimes the food that you are eating, the different tools that you have, your car. So, we are in a global world. So, it's very important to have this global worldwide awareness. And I know this is a tough thing for many of you. You don't read newspapers and, and you'll say, this is the old guy, he wants us to read newspapers. Read it online if you wish. But there's no escaping the fact that you need to bring a wider awareness to what you do. You don't live in a pigeonhole. You don't live in a narrow siloed world. You live in a vibrant, interconnected, global world. So, your MBA should reflect that. What you study in your MBA, the projects you choose, you have a lot of options. The teachers are not the only guides, you can guide yourself. So, you can choose projects that have to do with countries that you would like to visit. You can work on industries that you would like to uh, actually work in, that you want to know more about. Maybe those industries have not come to India as yet. Maybe they are only existing in other countries, but that's okay. Uh, you can still learn, you can be on the cutting edge. I remember when cyber security became a big deal. Today, now it's a part of every platform. You know, as we, you know, we have a course called Technology in the Digital Economy, where we talk about social mobility, analytics and cloud and cyber security, the five things that are part of every technology platform. And then you look at all the new technologies that are, so these things are just emerging every year. Ten years ago, cloud computing was nowhere. Today, it's everywhere. So, the world changes literally around us every day and we have to stay on top of the world. So, again, if you want to optimize your MBA, make sure a part of your attention is always on the rest of the world, on the global facing world. And there's many ways you can integrate that, as I mentioned, with the projects that you do, with the readings that you do, with possibly the internships that you pursue. So, even if it's a local company, if they have global customers, you can learn a lot. So, global facing, another good, good thing. In that context, something that we are doing at Shiv Nadi University is encouraging our students to learn a foreign language. And by foreign language, already if we have English and most of us know some form of Hindi as well, we are taking care of one of the biggest domestic markets in the world, which is India. So, if India itself is going to be a huge domestic market, you are good with English and Hindi. But, what if you learnt Mandarin? Which is what we are doing in our university. What if you learnt how to deal with the Chinese? That's a big deal because 40 percent of world trade in another 50 years, when you guys are mature, when you are ready to become CEOs or already heading your companies, much of our trade is going to be with China. So, Mandarin today, if you have the opportunity, if you have the time, can be a very strategic investment and that will enhance the value of your MBA tremendously. Another language which Indians can learn quite easily is Spanish. It comes relatively naturally to us. Um, and so, Spanish is another great language. The US is on its way to becoming a Spanish country. It's basically going to be majority Hispanic in another 10 years. So, your Spanish skills will come into great use all over the US, Latin America, different parts of the world. Uh, so, as part of your global endeavor, try to find the time. It will be hard. MBA programs are very intense, but maybe before, maybe after. I am just pointing that out as a career enhancing option, even if not an MBA enhancing option, is to learn a language. If you can, you will lift yourself into a different level. So, that is a, you know, a key asset that you will be able to bring uh, to uh, the table whenever you are actually either looking for a job or launching your company. Yet another piece that I wanted to mention, having talked about the world, I first mentioned that we are blessed to be in now what will become one of the biggest markets in the world. Think of what happened to the MBAs in the US in the 50s and the 60s. That's why they became, which is the opposite of being global, is called ethnocentric. 
where they were only concerned with the US. They would say, bhai, our market is so big. Agar market is so big, then what do we need to do with So that was the idea. Now, I'm not saying India will ever be like that. But at the same time, we are blessed to have a huge domestic market that will only grow. It will, India is going to become the largest economy in the world in another 40 years. And the big part of our Indian economy is the, today the rural economy. Today we have 600 million people, twice the size of America, who are in the rural sector. It's the fastest growing sector of India. It's where the most money is going to be made, where the emerging consumers of tomorrow reside. So, just as I said, as you're global facing, the other side, I'm saying, must take advantage of being very knowledgeable about emerging India. Because emerging India is very, very exciting. And what is happening in India, what is happening in rural India, the whole world is taking notice. You may have noticed how many companies are entering India every day. That's, only, that's the only reason. And we are already there. This is our country. So we must learn to be extremely aware, extremely smooth, extremely facile in navigating doing business in our own country. So just as much as the global facing part is important, facing and being ready for emerging India is equally, equally central. Another big part of optimizing your MBA, and that's an obvious one, is networking. The MBA is all about relationships. The relationships you have with your fellow students, with students from other universities who are pursuing MBAs at the same time. So it's very good if you get involved in inter-college festivals. Get involved in the organization of those festivals. That's how you will meet people. Get active, get out there. Build relationships. These relationships will be worth their weight in gold. Uh, so be very, very active in forming great friendships as well as building good business relationship. Good business relationship doesn't mean that you and I have to be buddies and have to have dinner and drinks every day. It just means that we have our contacts, we know what each of us is doing and that when the opportunity arises, we say, oh yes, I know that person. And I have enough, I have maintained the relationship enough that I can pick up the phone and they will take my phone. Or I'll send an email and they will respond to my email. Or I'll send a WhatsApp message and they will respond. That's what networking means and that networking is invaluable. So you have no excuse to not knowing everybody in your own program. Try to know people outside your program. Try to know faculty. Your faculty have huge contacts generally. So faculty are very, very useful people to cultivate. Learn why they became faculty. Learn what their interests are. They will be able to point you into new directions. So overall, in optimizing your MBA, networking is very, very critical. My final point, and before I start taking questions from you, is the question of leadership. Ultimately, you're doing the MBA because you want to be a leader. You want to be a business leader. Now, leadership is, in some ways, we are born with it. But it can be developed and it can be cultivated. Ideally, your MBA program should formally expose you to the elements of leadership development. Um, I'll give you an example. At Shivnada University, for example, we expose them to industry leaders from outside. They see successful leaders, they learn their life stories, and they can imbibe a few lessons from them. Along that same line, I often encourage MBA students, read biographies. Read the life story of successful people whom you really admire. You can learn a lot from them. You can learn a lot from them. In Hindi, of course, we say, Buddhiman ke liye ishara kafi hai. So same thing. You can learn from the life of a successful entrepreneur and say, yeah, maybe I can emulate him or her in this area. So learn about leadership. Leadership is not just given. Leadership is developed and it is developed through experience. So the actual skills, so look for that in your program. The other side of leadership, and that's the last point I'll make before I take questions, is working on self-awareness. It's extremely important for you in your life to be a happy, fulfilled human being 
and be an effective business leader to be self-aware. You must know who you are. You must have a sense of what comprises your personality. I encourage people to always see themselves on video. If you've never seen yourself on video, and by the way, in our programs, we force our students to constantly make presentations and see those videos because that's how you will learn. You will learn by watching yourself and you say, Arey, that's what I do. How can I change? How can I get better? So self-awareness, both visually seeing yourself and self-awareness in terms of learning about your personality is a very, very key part. And ideally, that too should be part of your MBA program. So overall, I've given you about seven or eight dictums that you can follow in seeking to maximize the impact of your MBA. And of course, the overarching theme remains, it's the level of your interest and engagement. As I said, that's the one thing nobody can take from you, how interested you are and how engaged you are. And you can take it from me. The more engaged you are, the more interested you are in business, the more value you will get from your business degree. So with that, um, I'm ready to take questions. So uh, the first question I have, what do you think is the best approach for an MBA student? Uh, and this is a question from Himanshu. Um, Himanshu, uh, my response to your question would be really in the items that I said. Uh, I said the best approach is one of interest and engagement. The best approach is one where you develop both your fundamental skills and your specializations. The best approach is to learn about technology and how it's going to change our lives. The best approach is to be global in your orientation. The best approach is to learn a lot and be deeply aware of business in our own country and of course to learn languages and to learn about leadership. Great. So now I see a question from Piyush. How important is it to be prepared for the basic subjects of MBA in the first year? Um, Piyush, that's a good question. Um, in some ways these are new to you. So you know, you're not necessarily going to be exposed to the subject per se before you've studied it. But what you can do to help yourself is to make sure your fundamentals in economics and mathematics and commerce are reasonably solid. You know, mathematics, you really need statistics. You need basic statistics uh, to be aware uh, and because you'll be manipulating lots of statistics in the analysis that you do. So if you're Statistics is very, very rusty. I mean, it's all simple stuff. We are not really talking about advanced mathematics in MBA programs, uh, except for those who get into quantitative finance. I mentioned to you that's one of the specializations we offer at Shivnada. For most MBAs, normal mathematics and statistics, but to the extent that you struggle with the class, class 10, class 12 level math, then yeah, you'll definitely struggle a bit in the MBA. So if you can refresh yourself Piyush, in those areas, then you're going to be better off. And again, economics, if you've been exposed to it, great. So if you are understand a bit about demand and supply and elasticity of demand and how prices are set, it will be a little bit of an advantage. It's not essential. Uh, the other side of your preparation would be presentation. And so I would encourage you to get into some kind of public speaking, even if to yourself, in the mirror, you know, think of a topic, say three minutes in it, record yourself, take a look. You will be impressed if you do that once or twice, how much better you will get each time. So these three areas are good preparation, preparing your presentation, preparing, you know, your writing and English, and, you know, those school leaving subjects so that you don't struggle with the basics when you come in because you'll already be reading and studying new subjects. So that's the, would be my response. Okay. Um, now the next person we have is Nina. Uh, which areas do you think we need to focus on? Uh, Nina, I did go through those. I hope you were there earlier with the seven areas that I mentioned. Uh, I believe the recording will also be available. So I don't want to repeat myself again. But those are clearly the areas that I think you should focus on 
to be uh, successful in your MBA. And if you're talking about getting into an MBA program, then obviously work on your communication skills, your interviewing skills, work in front of the camera, work on your math uh, skills, and those will be very helpful to you. Okay, next question from Arnab is, my thoughts on the case study approach in college, um, everyday information and everyday, okay. So two questions here really. One is about the case study approach and one is about information security. The case study approach is a wonderful innovation. It's no surprise, therefore, case studies, role plays, simulations, full spectrum simulations of entire businesses are very much a part of all advanced MBA programs. So for instance, in our MBA program at Shivnada, not only do we teach design thinking at one end, but we are taking you through a full simulation at the other. So it's really, really important for you to learn, as it were, by observation. That's what cases allow you to do. The Harvard case system or the Harvard case method led to many problems when it first got introduced, by the way. In the 70s, the Harvard MBAs thought that, okay, I've done a case, so I've become an expert in this industry. I've done a film industry case, so I'm a film industry expert. I've done a retail industry case, I've become a retail industry expert. That proved to be very shallow. Uh, and they had real problems before uh, the systems were changed. This is all before any of you were born. So you don't have to be worry, worried about them today. But the fact matter is that the case study approach has been around for a long time. And it's a very valuable approach because it gives you a window, a deep window into an industry. And it's like in a short crash course on an industry. So if I've done an automobile case, I actually know the, at least the basics of automobile manufacturing. I know the basics of steel, or I may know the basics of aeroplanes, or I may know the basics of gap genes, or I may know the basics of, you know, uh, financial management and portfolio management. So case studies are a great window into rapid learning. So I deeply endorse them. We use cases very extensively, both in the undergraduate and the MBA programs, because they give you ready learning. The second part of the question was on information security. You couldn't have picked a better subject today. Information security or overall cyber security is one of the hot areas. When I was talking about disruptive new technologies, I didn't mention Internet of Things. Internet of Things is coming, it's already there. There are applications coming literally every day. Uh, just as UAV, you know, you have this uh, uh, really automated driving or driverless uh, cars, drones, drone technology. Drone technology in conjunction with Internet of Things is an unbelievable capability. What it will do to the world, we don't fully even understand today. So imagine now if such a network that you created, brilliant application for agriculture, was easily, easily uh, hacked into. Somebody could steal your data, somebody could steal. So information security, it's vital today, it's going to be 20 times more vital tomorrow. Uh, and so if you pursue a actual specialization in information security, you'll do very well. My, again, my ad added comment on that, there's two sides of information security. One is as a manager. As a manager, I have to deploy information security. I have to make decisions. I have to decide how much does it cost, should we invest, how much security do we want, 24-7, what is the, the level of investment we want. That is one side. That usually happens when people get senior in their careers. The second part of the information security question is those who are actually writing the algorithms and writing the code. So in response to your question, if you are mathematically inclined and get into the creation of information security solutions, if you get into cryptography, if you get into the algorithms that make security, you're headed for a very rosy life. You're headed for a very rosy life. That is a fantastic area to focus on. Okay. Uh, next question that I see is on emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence, absolutely. 
you mentioned that I talked to you about it in terms of networking and I especially talked to you about it in terms of self-awareness. What is emotional intelligence ultimately? Emotional intelligence is the ability to not just talk but listen and listen smartly because when you listen you learn. You know people often get trapped and of course in this case I am doing a monologue with you but people are only talking. It's the listening where the leaders truly learn and emotional intelligence gets displayed in how you listen and how you respond to what the other person is saying. Now there's two sides of communication. As you know verbal communication is only a small part of the actual communication. Non-verbal communication is actually the biggest part. So when you are into deep listening or what is called appreciative inquiry, we teach appreciative inquiry, you know. So how do I appreciate this person when they are talking to me? Which means I pay attention to them, I don't interrupt them, I don't sit with my mobile, I don't look around, I meet their eyes. Those are all part of emotional intelligence because they are giving the other person a sense of importance and they are allowing them to understand that this person who is sitting across me is actually paying attention to me. And you are much more likely to persuade them to do what you want them to do if you engage in an emotionally intelligent conversation. So emotional intelligence big part of our programs and it should be a big part of your own learning. Okay, a question from Vishal. On the digital marketing certificate or any online certification along with the course. Now, we already have a course on digital marketing. Now, digital marketing is comes in two ways. There's the building blocks of digital marketing, which you can get from online courses. Uh, those are typically not taught. You know, it's things like search engine optimization, as an example using the keywords correctly, uh, choosing your site, doing the background research so that when your uh, keyword term is actually brought up, it comes up within the first page. Uh, how do you, how quickly do you respond to social media messages? How accurately does the organization listen? Today I talked to you about emotional intelligence. Organizational emotional intelligence today is learned through digital marketing. How responsive they are, how quickly do they respond to your comments? So that part of digital marketing, we allow an online certification through a workshop. Students have to pay an extra charge for a workshop. There are various workshops that are available. There are also free workshops and certifications available uh, online through edX and Coursera. Certifications typically cost money. The coursework doesn't cost money. So these will supplement your class. But our classes are taught by experts in digital marketing people who are typically running large digital marketing practices, who have written books on the subject. So you don't strictly speaking need to get an extra certificate, but today's world, you get an extra certificate in digital marketing, it will not hurt you. Okay. Next question from Anand, core MBA or a specialization? Well, uh, I mentioned at the outset, Anand, uh, that we go with the two the T-shaped solution. The, there's no such thing as a just a core MBA. Um, you by definition you need to specialize even within the core. So say if you say core MBA and you're hardcore, you're into finance and your specialization is also in finance, then yeah maybe that's kind of a core. But in reality it's not a choice. You need, you need both a strong core it's like your body, you know, we talk when you build your body, you need a strong core in your body for your muscles to be actually active and for you to perform at a higher level. Uh, so you need a strong core, you need that strong horizontal base and then you need some specialization. Uh, the specialization may not be always immediately usable. The first job you get may be a generalized uh, pre-sales job or a sales job or a customer service job or anything but they all come into use later. That is the one amazing thing that everything you learn sometime or the other in your life will come back to you and you'll say, yeah, you know, I learned that and it's now actually helping me. 
So, I, I believe it is an artificial distinction and certainly in programs like Shiv Nadi University, it is artificial distinction between a core MBA and a specialization because by definition you are going to get both. Okay. Um, Omkar is asking how difficult a subject in is an MBA in finance. Uh, Omkar is, it depends, it really depends. There's financial management is not difficult. You know, accounting is not difficult. However, it's maybe not fair for me to say it's not difficult. If your math is really bad, suppose you've not done mathematics after class 8, you know, you never did even at the high school level, then yeah, maybe you will struggle. If you've never seen a you know, an equation, you don't know what multiple regression is, you know, things like that. There are things you learn. There, there, again, we have so many people from liberal arts backgrounds who come who have not done these things, especially this is so common in the US. I was in the US for many, many years. Many of our students came from very disparate backgrounds. So, and they were interested in finance too. So, within finance, there are areas that are less quantitative and there are areas that are more quantitative. So, when you specialize, it depends on what you specialize in. Uh, as I said, as long as your basics are okay, you will not struggle in finance. But if you want to be a person who gets into algorithmic trading, you know, for financial and investment analysis, you want to become a chartered financial analyst, you want to actually do theoretical research uh, for hedge funds, then yeah, you know, if your math is not very strong, you will struggle. So again, remember finance has a very big area. There are parts of finance that are not as quantitatively intense. There are parts of finance that are very quantitatively intense. It depends on your own preferences and capabilities. At the MBA level, certainly at the core course level, as long as your base in mathematics is okay, you will have no problem. Tarun. Basis to select an MBA college? Good, good question, Tarun. Uh, as I said, one way to look at it, if I were doing it, what you were doing, I would look at those six, seven things that I mentioned at the outset. That does the program have the pieces that I want to learn more on? The second part that you want to really see is what is the quality of the cohort? What are the other students? going to be like. And one of the advantages that we have created at the Shiv Nader MBA program is that we also combine in our MBA program a corporate MBA uh, uh, students. So these are people with work experience already in the program who are coming through a different channel uh, into the program. So having a mix of students is also a very important criterion for selection. Uh, beyond the seven or eight items that I said, they should be the breadth of courses, they should be uh, really exposure to the global market, you should definitely be exposed to technology, to simulations, and of course, placement help. Any decent school should make a big effort towards helping you get placed. And one of the things that we are proud of, we are very early, we are a new school compared to only a few years of a track record, but we have a stellar record in that narrow band. So having a career development center, having a student based placement cell is very important, not only for your own experience, but for the experience of the whole program itself. Okay, Ansh, what can be the best use of idle time we get after college is over until we get into college? Very good question Ansh. Uh, one is to brush up on your basics. As I said, if you feel for whatever reason, your basics in English speaking and writing, because after all the language of instruction is English, you could remedy that, that will go a long way. Believe me, take a course in communication, take a course in public speaking, or do what I just said, practice by yourself, practice with your family in a non-threatening, non-judgmental environment. It's very important to practice this in an area where you don't feel judged, where people are saying, look, you're, you're one of us, we are all in the same boat, you're going to say it, I'm going to say it. That's what class presentations do. Everybody is learning at the same time. So, so one is practicing your communications, both written and uh, verbal. Second is the mathematics 
part. The third uh, could be uh, said learning up on economics and statistics. If you are just, you know, not just have math and never been exposed to stat, that would be a decent use of your time. If you are okay with all of them, then let me share what I did myself. I traveled. I traveled. I have traveled around the country. Uh, by that time, I was in the US. I traveled around the US. I had two months. And that was proved to be some of the greatest learning that I had. So that is definitely my personal view. I have to say, uh, maybe your parents won't be as excited to tell you that, that uh, the professor said to go and travel. But that's the best way to learn, to meet people, to expose yourself to different situations, to live uh, in a scenario or a environment which is outside that which you are familiar with. See, that is what travel teaches you is to take you out of your comfort zone. And once you are out of your comfort zone, you learn a lot about yourself. So, as I said to answer to the question from Ansh, if you indeed feel your basics are okay, then go out and explore the world. That will be a beautiful thing you can do because you won't really, really get time after the program starts and then you start working and so on. So, in that sense, it's a precious opportunity for you. Okay, so Piyush is the same. Uh, Piyush, maybe should we pursue extra courses related to my specialization from outside of the college to gain an advantage and have an outstanding CV? Um, Piyush, it's, it can't be bad, but I don't believe it is necessary. I personally don't believe it is necessary. Certainly, if you show that type of interest, people will be impressed. But people will be more impressed if you go and do service or do seva, go volunteer, go work with a startup firm, volunteer your time and say, how can I be an intern? Can I help you with a market survey? So, exposing yourself to the world of business uh, would be as impressive to them. Uh, certainly, taking part in competitions. There's so many competitions these days for especially for business challenges, business plans. So, so if you are interested in those things, those will definitely enhance your CV. Uh, in terms of taking specialized courses, yeah, as I said, you absolutely, it will not hurt you. I would especially encourage the big online repositories which have courses from virtually every major university in the world. In some senses, you know, you will be jumping the gun because you will learn these things later anyway. Uh, but if you have the time, if you have the interest, I cannot say that it will not help you. It will definitely help you. Vishnu. Vishnu has said, what do you think of tourism and hospitality as a specialization? Vishnu, that's a great question. Tourism and hospitality is going to be a big sector in India. I think India has so far, from a tourism and hospitality standpoint on the global market, been frankly been pathetic. We get as many tourists in all of India as little Thailand, which is the size of one of our states, gets in the entire year. So, clearly, we have a lot to do in terms of infrastructure. So, our infrastructure is rapidly catching up. Our, um, you know, hotels, our services, the whole government efforts with, you know, Atiti Deva Bhava and Shining India, all of those things, what we call the ecosystem for tourism is getting better and better and better. So, I consider tourism to be a sunrise sector in India. We are actively considering offering tourism and hospitality management as an undergraduate specialization uh, in our program. Uh, and increasingly, there will be options for people to do internships in those areas. In this area, I would also mention sustainability and ecotourism. Sustainability and ecotourism will grow even faster than regular tourism. Uh, and India is incredibly well poised for that. India is an amazing country. I mean, when you, especially when you come from outside, when you live long time outside, you realize what an incredible country we have. Just geographically, we have 4,000 miles of beaches. We have the highest mountains in the world. We have the big deserts. We have wildlife. We have monuments that are among the oldest in the world. We have deep cultures. We have tribes. I mean, we've got everything. We've got amazing cuisine, 
And so we've just got it all in terms of tourism, and which is why I made the strong statement that our performance in this sector, frankly, has been pathetic. And that can only get better. It can only get better. So the long answer to your question is that tourism and hospitality is a great sector and you should pursue your interest. Even if you study in a normal MBA program that does not have tourism, study marketing, study finance, those will come into big play into tourism. Okay. Nina has asked, how important is it to get a very good MBA college in India abroad? Does an average college affect us drastically? Nina, that's a complex question you're asking. I'll give you two kind of statistical responses, which may surprise you. When I was in the US, um, and I used to teach at Boston College, the Carroll School of Management was called. So there we did a study at that time, and we asked, and the students had done a survey, that how many of the Fortune 500 CEOs came from the top MBA institutions, the top 10 MBA institutions. In fact, it was not even top 10, because US has so many good ones. I think we used top 50 MBA institutions, because in reality, the differences are very, very minor. Uh, so we took the top 50 MBA institutions, five zero. Guess what the percentage of CEOs of Fortune 500 from the top institutions was? And we're not having a conversation, so I can't hear what you're obviously you're saying at this point, but the number was pathetically low. It was 15%. 85% of the people came from all kinds of places, many of which nobody had ever heard of. Okay? So, first and foremost, it's the first point that I made today. Your success in life is going to be determined by who you are, how engaged you are, how much belief you have in yourself. That is far bigger than any program you go to. Yes, if you go to a top program, it can ease things for you. Your first placement might be a little easier. But I'll tell people first placement is not important. It's your second placement and your third placement. That's what's really important. It's your second job, your third job. Uh, those are the ones. So there's no statistical uh, distribution which suggests that people who come from so-called lesser known places don't do as well. I'll give you another example from Tata. I was with the Tata group for a number of years. And there we have a very fast track MBA, pro, uh, MBA program. We took only the elite MBA program. Again, the number of those people who actually went on to become leaders and part of the C-suite was surprisingly small. It was only less than 10%. So have confidence in yourself. Get into the best school you can. But the best school you can has to be more based on some of the items that I mentioned that they should provide services to you. They should provide access to you. Uh, the reputation by itself doesn't mean that much if they don't do anything for you. So that would be my answer, uh, Nina, that believe in yourself, get into the best frame of mind you can get into, into whichever program you get into, and give it your best. If you do that, you will succeed. Arnab has asked, do you think learning a foreign language will make an impact. Yes, Arnab, I did cover that uh, in my earlier presentation. It's possible that you were uh, had not dialed in at that point. Uh, what I said is I gave an example of what we're doing at Shiv Nader, where given that Indians are already have the advantage of knowing at least two languages, you know English, you know some degree of Hindi, many of us may know one of the regional languages, you may know some of the, you know, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, you may know Bengali, you may know Gujarati, you may know, all of these are going to be important. As I said, we are going to be a huge domestic market. All our languages are important. So Indians are already multilingual and we are the envy of many countries as a result of that. We're all naturally multilingual uh, and we grew up that way. If you want to add a language, I would advise adding Mandarin. Mandarin because the business opportunities between India and China over the next 20 years are going to be huge. The other language I would suggest is Spanish. Spanish is sweeping, in a sense, the Americas, both North and South America are increasingly turning Spanish. Given that they will be major markets for a long time to come, 
clearly learning Spanish will be a great thing. So if somebody knows Spanish and Hindi English, then great shape. Somebody knows Hindi English, Mandarin, then great shape. So net net, yes, if you can find the bandwidth to learn a language, you can only do yourself good. Harish, oh Harsh, Harsh, if any student got less marks in schooling graduation, will it affect admission in a good B school? Uh, I don't believe so, Harsh. Uh, it depends. Now, certainly our top IIMs today go with a very traditional uh, admission system. This, it's CD, you just take the cat, you get your marks, there's a cutoff, and it's over. There's nothing else. Take a look at programs like ours, which are more internationally focused. At Shivnada, our, the weight we give to the standardized exam is low. The weight we give to your past schooling is low. What we are most interested in is what are you doing with your life today? What have you done after you left college? Hopefully, you've got some work experience. How did you do in the work experience? How did you do in our interview? How well are you able to marshal your thoughts? How well are you able to present your views? How convincing are you? How persuasive are you? How well do you write? Those are the things that are a lot more important to many schools increasingly than your standardized test scores. I have written articles on this subject in the national papers. There is no correlation between those who do really well on those tests and those who do really well in business, those who do really well in school and those who do really well in business. So we don't believe in it. I don't believe in that personally. So there are many good schools that you will get into if you are a good, well-rounded candidate. You have to be a good, well-rounded candidate, no question. You have to be uh, present yourself well, your math skills have to be decent, your communication has got to be great, you've got to be confident, your knowledge, your desire to learn has to be good, your personality has to be engaging, outgoing, your interest in business has to be evident. That's the core thing, you're studying business, you have to be interested in business. So those are the things that are much more important. Jatin, can an entrepreneur get any benefit in pursuing an MBA for building an agrotech business in the future? Absolutely. You mentioned agrotech. Agrotech is another of those sunrise sectors in India. Uh, I'm in fact on the board of an agri company, so I'm particularly close to this subject. India is a, actually a goliath in agriculture already. We produce almost 1 billion tons of food every year. We have gone through a huge change in the last 20 years. And the potential for India to become the breadbasket of the world is very high. Next to America, we have the highest arable land in the world. So if we can figure out the water issue, which we think we will, I think deep, deep, deep sea and seawater salinity Salinization is going to become a commercial reality in coming years. So agri and agri-tech is going to be huge. The skills you learn in business school are going to be vital for you. You will need all aspects. Ultimately, as you progress through a business program, and I'll give you the example at Shiv Nada, as you get to your final semester, you're looking at the entire business. You're looking at the entire business as a whole. For instance, tomorrow, in fact, I'm beginning a... Uh, teaching a, a, a full spectrum simulation, which forces the students to really make decisions, every aspect of the business. Uh, everything from where will the factory located, what products will produce, what features will they have, who will be higher, how much will we price them, which customers will we target. I mean, you name it. Every aspect of the business has to be decided. So now imagine you're coming through such a program you're getting ready to launch your agrotech business. You've already done your internship there. Maybe you've done two, three projects in that area. I would suggest linking it all to your end goal. Do all your projects towards your end goal. So you'll already be ahead of the game. So I absolutely uh, would underscore that the MBA will be a vital foundation for you. Okay. Ramnik is asking, how much do you think is the competition between an MBA student from India as compared to an MBA student from abroad, do you think abroad students have more knowledge or given more preference as is India? Knowing someone from abroad automatically gives them edge. You know, Ramnik, it's a good question. It's a hang up. We've had, we've had it for a long time. 
Uh, Rabindranath Tagore was the first Indian to win a Nobel Prize in 1915. Okay, we're talking about 103 years ago, and he said, "Yeah, India, me. If you don't become famous overseas, nobody pays attention to you." So we've had this hang-up because we were colonized. We were we were taken over by another country, and we were in a sense oppressed by them. So we are still getting rid of our history. You, as this generation, are special compared to, say, my parents' generation. My parents' generation still knew there was some degree of gulami. You know, we were we grew up as free Indians. You guys have grown up as free Indians for generations. So there should be no view in your mind that you are not equal to anybody else. From my personal experience, I have I have. Obviously, I've taught in business schools around the world, in Europe, in the U.S. I've given lots of lectures, and I can tell you the biggest seeming difference that I see is in the level of confidence, and that too is in the best university. So, if you recall when I said that, what can you do to do well in the MBA to optimize? Is work on your self confidence. If you work on your self confidence, you work on your general knowledge of business. And you work on your awareness of the world, what we call the world view. जो दुनिया में हो क्या रहा है? आपको पता है जो दुनिया में हो क्या रहा है? Technology में क्या हो रहा है? Politics में क्या हो रहा है? Economics में क्या हो रहा है? That world view. So if you incorporate those into your being, there's no difference. There's really no difference at all. And certainly there's no difference in the potential. That is one thing I can tell you for sure. There's no difference in what you can be. Um, I'll give you one example in this. Um, I often lecture at something called the Human Capital Leadership Institute in Singapore, and there you get executives from all over Asia: uh, Chinese and Malaysians and Indonesians, Filipinos, Japanese, Koreans, Australians. You name it. Everybody asks the same question: "Ji, what is special about the Indians? Ye Indian kyu CEO bante? Hai? Why do the Indians become CEOs of global firms and not the other Asians?" Uh, so. Far from being sort of a less skilled, we've anything we have an edge. We have an edge on most. Yeah, maybe there are few places that people are just have had a little deeper indoctrination. That true even here, there'll always be better candidates and less superior candidates. But there's nothing fundamental. There's nothing fundamental. We are as good as anybody, and I can tell you that from a 30-year experience in teaching kids from all over the world. Okay, Vishnu Vandana. Our Vish does group discussion and personal interview play a crucial role while getting admission? Yes, Vishnu, it does. Uh, depends on the program. For instance, at Shivnada, we don't have a group discussion. We have a personal interview, and the personal interview is very important, definitely. But the personal interview, just so you know, is not designed to show how smart the interviewer is. That's what I tell the faculty. The idea is not to show the. Uh, candidate, how smart we are. The idea is to learn how smart the candidate is. So we try to make the candidates comfortable. We want them to talk about themselves. We want them to talk about जे आपने क्या किया है? What is it that interests you? Where are, where do you think you want to go? So when you come to the interview, be prepared with your own story. Understand your own journey so far. What is the things that have driven you? What are the things that have That's what we are looking for, and most schools are looking for that. That they are looking for people who can talk in a reasonably convincing, compelling manner about their own journey thus far. Okay, uh, Tarun, how much does it help doing MBA from outside a state in grooming the personality? Uh, uh, Tarun, I'm not sure which state you're in uh, right now, but yes. It helps in a different way, as I said, to move away. Use the metaphor I gave of the comfort zone. Whenever you move out of your comfort zone, you're from the east, you come west, you go from the north, you go south, south, you come north. All of those things, as long as you're going to a good institution, that extra exposure will only help you. So, in that sense, yes, it will help groom you because it will challenge you. And by definition, the more challenged you are, the better you're going to become. So my answer to your question would be a definite yes. Divya, last question. Okay, last question from Divya. If I want to start my own business after an MBA, 
what do you think I should start focusing on now and which areas do I need more focus on? Divya, that's a great question. Just so you know, I mean, I've been a serial entrepreneur. You know, uh, in my years, I've, you know, I've started five or six companies. I spent 20 years outside academics. I left academics, I came back. I was a professor, then I started my own company, then I came back to academics. Um, so certainly from that perspective, I can tell you how much my business education, my own MBA helped me start my own business. Certainly teaching also greatly helped. So overall, being immersed in a business environment, which is what the MBA will do, is a great, great practice run for starting your own business. The second aspect is that you want a program that gives you the freedom to continue to work on your business while you're studying. So again, I'm giving you obviously the example I know best, which is Shivnader, where we have the School of Management and Entrepreneurship. So by definition, we are encouraging and inviting entrepreneurs to join us. And we invite them to keep thinking of those ideas while they're learning their courses. We have an incubator on campus. So we, if you have a great idea, you win uh, in some of those competitions, we can actually even support you. We can get you mentors, we can give you money, we can help you get commercialized. So in all respects, most business schools can genuinely advance the learning for an entrepreneur because you need the fundamentals. You also asked what areas should you most concentrate on. Go back to that horizontal piece that I mentioned at the outset. You need all of those to actually create your business. Think, your business will have operations. You need to understand operations well. Your business will have people. Ultimately, the heart of business is people. So OB and HR and learning how to give feedback and learning how to select and learning how to involve your team, great, great learning. Your business is going to be all about sales and marketing. So of course you need to know about sales and marketing. And ultimately, you've got to balance your books. You've got to make money. You've got to sell your products for revenues. You've got to make profits. So finance, marketing, operations, OB, strategy. Strategy is the direction of your business. So the core courses that I described, the horizontal piece, are all vital for setting up your own businesses. So you will automatically get those if you enroll in an MBA program. Okay. Um, any more questions? Great. Well, thank you all. So, oh yeah, please. Um, yes, I hope you, uh, if you have more questions, please send them in. We'll try and respond to them to you anyway. So thanks for joining in and thanks for your attention today.